Hey guys, welcome to Book Review 136. Today I will be reviewing Island of Shame, The Secret History of U.S. Military Bases on Diego Garcia by David Vine. Alright, so this is a classic David and Goliath story um, where the United States government uh, plays uh, Goliath and the uh, local people um, of the Chagos uh, Island chain, um, and specifically Diego Garcia, the overwhelmingly largest uh, island in this chain, um, are essentially at loggerheads because the, uh, the Chag Chagoese, I believe that's how it's pronounced, the Chagosian uh, people um, no longer live on this island chain. They were expelled by the U.S. government in the mid-1960s um, in order to establish uh, a military base there that essentially acts as um, the United States uh, military headquarters in the Indian Ocean region, um, being able to cover everything from the Middle East to South Asia to Southeast Asia to um, the eastern part of Africa. Um, so, how did this all come about? Well, um, you really have to look uh, kind of at, at World War II as sort of the, the turning point. Because before then, um, the British, who are the ones that are technically still the heads of um, the British Indian Ocean Territory, or what is, that's their name for, and that's the... Um, state name for it, uh, which is the Chagos Island chain. Um, they were essentially, uh, before World War II, starting to, and post-World War II, uh, losing colonial power all around the world. Um, and, you know, justifiably, p uh, countries were gaining their independence. Um, people had more right to self-determination. Um, but there was also fear in the West that a lot of these um, countries, as they gained independence, would create a world instability. And specifically, um, China and Russia and the effects that uh, those countries could have on other countries uh, in the Indian Asian uh, region. Now, the United States um, already had Guam and uh, well, I should backtrack a little bit. Um, there was this guy named uh, Stu, um, I want to say Stu Baker, but that might be wrong. But what he essentially said is, is the way that the United States, who was the predominant post-World War II player, was going to control the world, or at least uh, um, keep both military stability as well as favorable economic advantage. It wasn't just all about containing the Russians, it was also providing uh, advantageous economic advantage for the United States. Uh, was through a fewfold. One, it was through uh, um, economic pressure, uh, but also there was this uh, theory of um, containment using remote islands um, that could quickly strike at countries that uh, if they got out of line or something went wrong. And you really see this all around the world. You see it from uh, the Falkland, Falkland Islands. You see it um, uh, uh, in Guam. You see it in the Marshall Islands. You see it in Samoa. Um, I'm trying to think of some more in the Atlantic that uh, the United States has military bases in. But essentially one area that they uh, did not have uh, sort of a containment island area in, or at least allies that would allow them to provide mil uh, large numbers of military bases there, um, was in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, you know, like Europe had bases in Germany, and I already explained some of the islands in the Pacific where the United States had military bases. So what the United States figured is they looked for areas around the Indian Ocean in order to um, build a military base. And that's where uh, the Chagos Island chain um, comes into the story. Uh, 
the Changyis, as uh, mentioned in the book, they talked a little bit about their history, are not native to the islands. The islands were actually inhabited, uninhabited, um, prior to colonial rule. They were known about by the uh, people of the Maldives. Um, but what essentially happened is there was two displacements. The first displacement uh, took place in the colonial era where people from the mainland of Africa, from um, uh, Madagascar, uh, and I think some from um, uh, Mar Maratus, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I got to know because it fits into the story. Uh, were essentially enslaved or taken or after slavery was abolished, um, brought as indentured servants to this island to work uh, as on, in a plantation economy um, for coconut harvesting, for uh, copra uh, production. Um, and one thing that the book mentioned was that, yes, it was very bad that this happened, um, but because there had been at least a few generations here by the time that the Chagoese had moved, they had considered it their home. Um, the United States actually tried to play off um, the Chago, uh, Changanese, man, I'm going to pronounce that wrong, uh, the people of Diego Garcia, which is the big island and the uh, outlying islands, um, as transient workers, as migrant workers, uh, but many had been there for multiple generations. They had considered this place their home. They knew no other homeland. I mean, they might have known that they were from somewhere else, but, you know, I'm German-American, like fifth generation, but that doesn't mean I consider myself German. I consider myself an American, and these people consider themselves uh, Changese. Um, and uh, let's see, where was I going with this? Uh, and so the United States um, essentially remove these people against their will. They did it in a very sort of slow creep way um, because post-World War II, the U UN was being set up and uh, one of the key charters of the U early UN uh, was decolonization uh, and specifically um, allowing people the right to self-rule, uh, allowing the people to self-determination um, and so any sort of nettling by uh, uh, these dying out colonial powers um, was uh, essentially illegal under UN Charter. Um, and so what the United States did is, uh, because it was a plantation economy, they essentially put pressure on the employers to um, cut people of their jobs, cut people of their wages. Um, when people, when the Chuggies took vacations uh either for um you know like personal enjoyment or a lot of times because they needed to get goods from uh Maritus. i think that's how you pronounce that island you know it's an independent country uh uh in the in the indian ocean uh they would essentially not tell them this but allow them to take those uh get out of the island chain to wherever they were going and then not let them return like the customs at the British Indian Ocean Territory would just like not let them uh, come back. Uh, but that only eliminated so many people. So I think they got, I don't know, half or a fairly significant number out, but they wanted to remove everybody so that the U.S. military base, and I'll get to this in a second, um, so that there weren't any people there. So eventually they did uh, expel people uh, and they did set up a, a trust fund. I should say it wasn't so, and again, I, uh, the Americans tried to remove themselves as much as they could from this. So it wasn't so much the Americans that were doing this, but it was the British who still had this as uh, a colony. Um, and that kind of just separated, like coincidentally they removed everybody and uh, shortly thereafter created this, uh, the United States leased uh, this land to create this giant military base in the exact area where they moved them. Well, coincidence, coincidence, right? Um, so yeah, they, uh, removed them all out and there's a very famous or very striking picture right here. This book doesn't have too many pictures in it, but, uh, of like when they told all the people that they would be removed. Uh, and in a second, I'll talk about some of the effects that that had, um, living, uh, as refugees or exiles abroad. Um, the United States secretly paid the British, uh, 
government uh, $15 million, but the way that they actually did this uh, is that uh, if they had to come up with the money directly, then they'd have to go through Congress. But the, the British government owed the American government some money for uh, essentially, I forget what the exact type of missile it was, but uh, a very, very highly advanced defense missile. And so the United States government, without Congress really knowing, essentially wrote that debt off the books uh, in order uh, to provide a way um, to uh, have uh, the United States pay Britain without anybody knowing about it, or at least without it uh, being in the, the sunshine of, you know, the uh, Congress, if you will. Um, there were multiple uh, uh, propositions to eventually set up a military base there. This is kind of uh, earlier on while the British are removing the Changis. Um, and they were turned down. And the book goes through all the um, military people that were involved in this, everyone from McNamara. Let's see if I can't find that page. Um, uh, Jesus, it's gonna take some time. Uh, so there was McNamara, and there was also like the head of the Navy, the head of the Air Force. The Air Force actually wanted to uh, set up uh, another base in the Shellanese Shel Islands. Um, uh, here you go. Okay, so uh, I'll just read the names real quick. quick. Admiral Arlea Bur Burke, Admiral Horatio Rivera, Paul Neitz, Robert McNamara, Thomas Moore, and Admiral Ed Edward Zumalt. Um, and so uh, initially some of these uh, propositions were turned down, um, but I believe it was really Zumalt uh, was the guy that would, oh no, not Zumalt, it was uh, Paul Neitz. Paul Neitz was the guy that um, was kind of, he would, I don't want to call him Dick Cheney, but to me in the book he kind of came across as a Dick Cheney type character in that he was fearful of like all the negative things that could happen in the Cold War, similar to what Cheney had when uh, you know the war on terrorism started. And so uh, in order to uh, uh, essentially preempt all of these negative scenarios, we needed to really have these bases around the world. He was really a key pusher in this uh, in order to protect American interests. And they said that he was one of the best memo writers uh, in the history of the modern United States in terms of really uh, scaring the crap out of people for uh, what could negatively uh, happen if they don't, you know, uh, carry out his plans. Uh, the other thing that really pushed it is that the head of uh, the Navy, who was always, the Navy was always the one that was the biggest pusher of this military base. I believe it was Edward Zumalt, I think. Um, he was essentially the head of the Navy, and then uh, when one of the previous uh, defense uh, secretaries, or Secretary of State, I believe, um, the Deputy Secretary of State resigned um, in a, kind of a mid-Johnson term. And so he replaced that person, essentially going from a the top of the military, but a military advisory position, to a civilian position. Um, but because he essentially already held these views, he uh, was able to, uh, as the book said, act as both the quarterback and the receiver in this plan. When he was head of the Navy, he threw the football, and when he was uh, in the State Department, he essentially caught the football that uh, made this plan go through. So anyway, it was a large creep of a kind of, uh, uh, or slow creep of kind of putting pressure to make this happen. Um, and I talked about how the, they were pushed out. Here's Aunt Rita. There you go. She's one of the Changalese. Uh, something interesting about the Changalese is they're really more African uh, than they are Asian um, or South Asian, like of Indian uh, ancestry. Um, but again, uh, they feel themselves the native peoples of this island. And to conclude the book, the author talks about, um, here's Rita Davis, she's another one. Essentially the deplorable conditions that these people were put under when they were moved to, let's see if I can get this right, Maratus in the, I'm pronouncing this wrong, in the 
Seychelles Islands. Um, and so they were essentially uh, treated as second-class citizens in these islands. Uh, they were given political status in Maritus. Uh, they were not given political status in the Shelley's Islands. Um, something interesting about both these countries is that their economies took off uh, kind of uh, around the same time or shortly thereafter um, that the expulsion from the Chagos happened. Uh, the Shelleys mostly with tourism, the Martus through uh, economic production zones, if you will. Um, but something interesting about it is that uh, the wealth gap uh, in these countries stratified as their economies took off. So it's not like all boats were rising. And one of the people that were left behind were the Chagos, who often lived in um, ghetto in the, the ghettos of, I think, the capital of San Lucia who lived in, you know, like, uh, pretty uh, deplorable conditions in um, slums. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. You know, slums in a lot of these, uh, in these two countries that they, they were forced to move to. Um, and so what the uh, Chagos are really looking for and what they've won in a couple of court cases since then, but have been overturned or either ignored um, by the military is one, for the most part, they're not looking to kick out the military base. There's kind of a split in the community how they feel about that. But I think most most uh, Ch Changiis, pronouncing that correctly, um, believe that the that it's just impossible. It'll be impossible to move the military base. But what they are looking for is they're looking for a be uh, to be able to return to the Chagos Islands. And live on, I don't know why they can't live on some of the outer islands to begin with, because that seems ridiculous, because the United States military pretty much only has its military base on Diego Garcia. Now, that is the largest island, but um, they're, and uh, the Changis are looking to return to Diego Garcia, too. Um, what they're hoping is that they can return. Um, something interesting about the military base is that it's completely cut off. Um, from outside influence, uh, reporters can't go there. It's sort of seen like the Holy Grail for reporters to report on that place because you, the military just cuts everything off. Um, no civilians can go there, except the fact that yachts can go there and are often, you can't fly in, but you can, if you own a, you're wealthy enough to own a yacht, the, the, the Navy will allow you to return. But the other thing that the other people that are there that are, you know, this super supposedly cut off area uh, is people that work on the military bases. And the United States has specifically kept the Changiis out of uh, employment on these military bases for fear of uh, political uh, reprisal and uh, brought in people who are not connected to the islands. Those from the Philippines, those from South uh, or those from India, those from what was the other place? I think they mentioned Sri Lanka um, because they know that uh, they're short term and they won't create any political problems. But that's really sort of uh, Machiavellian real politic rather than uh, focusing on what the native peoples of, uh, and they really did feel that they were native peoples of these islands deserved. Um, the other thing that the uh, Changis are looking for is compensation. Um, there's only about 2,000, uh, I think it's like two to 3,000 Changis total. So it would really be a pretty big drop in, or pretty small, excuse me, drop in the bucket um, compared to what the United States spends on military in that area. And considering how deprived their lives have been since being moved out, uh, it's really pretty justified that they are uh, compensated. Uh, the Changis aren't necessarily looking for independence. I think that there just aren't enough of them. Plus, uh, like, I, real, I, I really think that the United States acts kind of paranoid in terms of what would happen if they returned the native peoples to these islands. Um, when in reality, even though, even if they were returned to the islands, I think that there would be a fairly easy compromise. And if a compromise couldn't be reached, now this is real politic again, I think the United States could essentially um, kind of have their way while uh, letting the people, the native peoples of these islands have their way uh, in the sense that I don't think that there's uh, ever going to be 
the military base is never going to uh, end there, at least without against the United States consent, uh, just by uh, the Changis. Okay, well, I've been kind of going on a little bit, but uh, you should read this book. It talks about some of the skeeziness of uh, uh, the American military, kind of um, how they try to get around things, how they try to influence power, and, you know, uh, how bad that can be sometimes. Uh, and also talks about the uh, sort of native peoples and uh, what they deserve in these islands. So... Island of Shame uh, by David Vine. The secret uh, his or Island of Shame: The Secret History of the U.S. Military Bases on Diego Garcia uh, by David Vine. Check it out. It's a great book, you guys. All right, bye.